Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Tapton School from Sheffield. They managed to know, was it six o'clock start? Or was that when you left? Six o'clock left, right? Okay, thanks for coming. Um, so, Tapton School, thank you. Good afternoon. We're Tapton School. My name's Shunidi. So cardiovascular disease is the single largest cause of death in the UK. It accounts for around 200,000 deaths a year, mostly as a result of heart attack or stroke. Arterial blockage is a major factor, and we aim to characterise novel genes that are differentially expressed in a clinical analysis of patients who have suffered a heart attack by studying orthologous genes in zebrafish cardiovascular system. These genes may be important in the response to a heart attack or act as a biological marker for heart disease. So a clinical study was completed at the University of Sheffield, whereby a gene expression of patients who have had a heart attack was compared against the gene expression patterns of patients who had not had a heart attack but were complaining of chest pains. And importantly, this control group did have atherosclerosis. So the gene expression patterns of these patients were monitored over a 90-day period using Affymetrix gene chips. Messenger RNA was extracted from blood samples, fluorescently labelled and then hybridised to the chip. After scanning, the data on the amounts of gene expressions was collated. The two data sets were compared and analysed for any differences. Genes that showed an increase or decrease in expression in comparison to the control were highlighted. The data from this was sorted and statistically analysed by Dr. Marta Milo from the University of Sheffield. Significant differences in gene expression of 82 genes were found. Now we aim to identify the roles of these genes in cardiovascular disease. So Shonidi has just spoken about the um, data that was collected for us by the University of Sheffield. Um, and now we're going to discuss what we've done with that data. The 82 genes identified from patients were ranked in terms of their differential and temporal expression profiles over the 90-day test period. Protein sequence alignments were performed to identify the zebrafish orthologs using Ensemble, which is an open source genetics database. Here are some protein sequence alignments we performed, and the green shows where the sequences are identical. We used protein instead of DNA, as multiple triplets can code for the same amino acid, making it harder to see the similarity. Orthologs with high percentage identity make good candidates to study, as they are more likely to perform the same function. We selected genes with greater than 70% homology, um, and then looked at genes which were either novel or whose function was poorly understood. Uh, Choice was also affected by the rank assigned to these genes. Um, we chose to investigate genes like cyclin-dependent kinase like 1 or CDKL1, which is the most differentially expressed gene in this study, persisting for 30 days. It is a novel gene and its function has been predicted through its similarity to genes involved in the cell cycle. Um, at last year's symposium, we listed some candidate genes and one delegate pointed out that there were two genes in our list involved in the same biochemical pathway. Alad and ferroquilatase are both involved in the synthesis of heme, so an interesting result for us. Our fourth candidate is TBC1D19. This belongs to a group of proteins involved in um, vesicle sorting. Um, it's poorly conserved, uh, it, sorry, it's poorly understood, um, but highly conserved, and um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but highly conserved, um, and they are likely to be important regulators of cell function. Um, so um, our study uses the zebrafish model organism to investigate uh, heart disease for a number of reasons. Well, firstly, zebrafish are transparent, so their development can be easily visualised down a microscope. And uh, when studying the development of the cardiovascular system, it's often useful to stop blood flow. 
Um, as the zebrafish embryo is only small, they can survive by simple oxygen diffusion, and so the effects of oxygen can be start um, can be sorry separated from hypoxia, which is just lack of oxygen. Um, we are closely supported by the Chica Lab, and um, they provide us with fixed embryos for study, and they have access to many of the mutants, but also fluorescently labelled embryos. And they can also modify. Um, blood flow pharmacologically or through the ablation of arteries using lasers. Um, in a few moments, Claire will discuss the science behind our in situ hybridization technique that we use to um, study the expression profiles of um, our genes highlighted by this study. Uh, but before we needed to attempt this technique, we had to um, perform a quick PCR analysis on embryonic cDNA to see if the genes were actually being ex expressed in the zebrafish. Mm -hmm. So the cDNA was derived from um, mRNA harvested from two-day post-fertilization embryos of the zebrafish. Um, this, oh. oh, so there are the fish. And <laughs> um, this slide shows our, uh, the presence of our four candidate genes um, uh, with the 1,000 base uh, uh, amplification fragments. Um, so from this result, we were clearly confident to proceed. So last year we came and we presented our very first in situ hybridization. And we did this using a probe that was synthesized and shown to work in the Chico lab. Since then, we've repeated and perfected our technique, and we're now confidently using it. And we're also synthesizing our own labeled anti-sense RNA probes. So the in-situ hybridization technique. Firstly, a specific anti-sense probe is synthesized from a DNA template that has been PCR amplified from cDNA. This 1000 base pair probe is anti-sense, and it is complementary to its target messenger RNA. The whole man embryos are initially fixed before getting washed with the probe, and this makes sure that the mRNA remains within the cell where it was transcribed. The cells which express the gene will produce mRNA, and therefore the probe will hybridize to its target within these cells. To identify the location of the probe, we use an antibody that can recognize digoxygenin, and digoxygenin is a chemical which we have attached to our synthesized probes. Um, this antibody is conjugated to an alkaline phosphate enzyme, and when this is washed with a chromogenic substrate, will cause a colour change from colourless to blue, and this colour change is going to occur in the cells where this gene is being expressed. So we can then observe and image the embryos with their specific blue staining pattern using our new microscope and image capturing software. <laughs> Immunostaining was inconclusive to allied FEC and TBC1 D19. The staining was most likely due to endogenous alkaline phosphatase activity in the notochord. The CDK01 probe, however, localized to distinct structures of the embryo, including the hypercord and the notochord. These are important developmental structures as they release chemical cues for adjacent cell differentiation. We are very confident on this expression pattern as it has already been published. At this point, we would like to change the title of our talk. We have some very new data which is indicating a role for CDK01. This preliminary data has led us to propose the following hypothesis, that CDK01 is involved in the signaling for the development of cardiovasculature. Clearly, we need to repeat and we need to check this data. However, it's also clear how exciting and how compelling this is and would like to share it with you today and explain the experiments which have led us to propose this. The images on this slide and all subsequent images have been produced in our school laboratory. Here we have a time course for CDK01 expression. You can see here on day one that CDK01 is expressed in the hypercord. You can also see that it's expressed in the hypercord on day two. However, it's not expressed in the hypercord on day three. The most important part of this is the fact that CDK01 is expressed in the hypercord. This is because the hypercord is thought to play a role in the development of the dorsal aorta. We can clearly see 
that the expression of CDK1 is moving from an anterior to posterior position within the fish, from here, from to here, to day two. This mirrors exactly the direction of the development of the dorsal aorta. So to further test this hypothesis, uh, we decided to look for CDK1 expression in mutants that have increased uh, blood vessel formation. We use VHL mutants because they're a model for hypoptia. This works by the regulation of uh, the HIF transcription factor complex, which is this here. Um, this controls genes that are associated with the formation of new blood vessels in the cardiovascular system. In normoxic conditions, proallyl hydroxylase, which is this bit, <laughs> um, causes hydroxylation of HIF. Um, the hydroxylation is then recognized by the VHL tumor suppressor gene, which is this bit here, and is targeted for ubiquitination and degradation at the proteasome, which is the bottom diagram here. The regulation allows fish to adapt to high epoxy conditions through the growth of more blood vessels. In oxygen conditions, uh, HIF is not hydroxylated and translocates into the nucleus, as on the right uh, hand side of the diagram, where it promotes the expression of its target genes. In VHL mutant zebrafish, where both uh, VHL alleles are being deleted, false hypoxic conditions are signaled, and this regulation is, of HIF is lost as it is not targeted for degradation, resulting in the zebrafish embryos with increased blood vessel formation. Uh, we proceeded to observe the pattern of expression of CDKL1 within the mutant zebrafish to see if they differ from wild type, um, and therefore indicating a role for CDKL1 in vascular formation for the first time. So our preliminary data suggests that CDKL1 expression is upregulated up, up in VHL mutant hypoxic embryos. We used three-day post-fertilization embryos for this experiment, as CDKL1 expression is not visible in the wild type. The VHL mutant is not viable as an adult, so to observe the homozygous recessive mutant embryo, it has to be generated by the F1 heterozygous cross. This slide summarizes the segregation of 19 offspring with the expected phenotypic ratios of a monohybrid cross where the VHL gene expresses co-dominance. So here we just have a Punnett square. And if we look at the bottom right panel, this one here, um, it shows a higher expression of CDKL1 between muscle blocks and in the notochord. So to verify these results, we need to individually image the embryos and then genotype them. But at a higher magnitude, the difference is clear to see. The transverse section, so um, that one there, the transverse, the transverse section shows the return of staining in the notochord and also the staining in the main dorsal aorta and the posterior cardinal vein, with diffuse staining in the somatic tissue, which may be signaling angiogenesis within the tissues. These results have led us to the hypothesis that CDKL1 has a novel role in the development of blood vessels, explaining its increased expression in heart attack patients. We plan to take this hypothesis further in future work. So finally, we'd like to thank the Chico Lab at the University of Sheffield for their support and discussions with experiments and providing us with the fixed embryos. Thanks must also go to the Wellcome Trust for their funding, which makes this project possible. Now, I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that we found the project extremely useful and motivating. It's certainly been a really good experience of practical science. So if you'd like to have a look at our poster later, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Mic gone. Lost the mic. Oh. <laughs> uh, what exactly about zebrafish makes them a good model for um, human cardiovascular development? Um. <laughs> Well, as I said, um, they are transparent as embryos, so we can see the development um, through a microscope, which um, in our school laboratory, laboratory um, makes them very useful. But also, 
because of um, <laughs> just joking. Um, because we, um, there is belief that they can undergo arteriogenesis, whereby they, when they have a blocked artery, they um, form um, little small arteries around it to supply the um, muscles with oxygen and other nutrients, which we can then hopefully maybe <laughs> see to interpret in humans. So they grow, they grow their own bypass. <laughs> Questions? So um, what most of the techniques you're doing, you're looking down the microscope and looking for the blueness. Is, is there a way to quantify that? Or, I mean, how, how do you decide how blue it is? Or is it obviously there or not there? So there's not like a... So we don't have a measurement of how blue something is and then you can say, oh, it's being expressed this much. But you can just kind of see by looking at the differences in colour. So you could say, oh, it's really strongly expressed or you weren't sure how strongly expressed. So no, we don't have a scale for it. It's just by imaging and looking at them. Um, yeah, talking about this CDKL1 gene, was it? Um, if this is actually involved in the formation of the cardiovascular system, how does this actually relate to disease? Is it possibly that this gene malfunctions to give you disease, or is it just you're not sure how it could actually link to disease at the moment? That's a very good question. It does. It does show an increased expression heart attack, but it's certainly novel at this stage. So further investigation would be required to get a function from it. Can I just make the point that when you have a heart attack, your, your system is going to try to uh, do a little bit of regeneration or repair. And in, in trying to decide who is going to do that successfully as a patient, you want to look at the genes that are likely to mediate repair. So in terms of of that context, it's very relevant to the uh, ability uh, to understand repair following heart attack, but also to find a marker that tells you which patients are likely to, to do it better than others. You had some very nice transverse sections of the zebrafish. I, I wondered how you managed to get such small things so beautifully sectioned, because they're very fiddly and tiny. I just wondered what you did to achieve that. So um, that was... That was pretty lucky, I'd say. It was, <laughs> <laughs> that was about the only one that we managed to get successfully. And it was just chopping up the little embryos, trying to do them as thin as you could. And then that one, we just got a really nice image with. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and time for last question, everybody. Mm, all done. Oh, yeah, over there, there we go. Sorry, so your title was How to Mend a Broken Heart. I was just wondering, um, how, how would you actually remove the disease once you've established it? It's not necessarily removing it uh, as such. Um, we think that what we kind of modifying the expression of CDPL1 could increase um, or speed up a patient's response to a heart attack and cover to a heart attack, which is really promising because it means uh, they might not have to be hospitalised for a lengthy amount of time. If a correlation between the expression of CDKL1 is actually linked to a heart, that's <laughs> excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>